Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books and Environmental Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host today, Brian Hamilton of Deerfield Academy, and I'm delighted to be joined by David Silkenet. He is Senior Lecturer in American History at the University of Edinburgh, the co-host of the podcast The Whiskey Rebellion, and the author of four books, including Raising the White Flag, How Surrender Defined the American Civil War, a finalist for the 2020 Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize. He is here today to chat about his latest book, Scars on the Land, An Environmental History of Slavery in the American South. It came out back in April from Oxford University Press, and you're going to want to get your hands on it. Dr. Silkenet, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Now, the the work you've done already in your illustrious career uh, largely centers on social and cultural history. And while this book is certainly a work of a social historian, it also, as the subtitle says, is an environmental history. And I'd love to hear how you made your way to that field. Sure. Um, so one of the, the challenges I always prevent, present for myself when I'm writing a new book is I, I try to, to make it each new project different enough than the last project. So you know, my first book is uh, kind of a cultural history. The second book is kind of a social history. The last book I wrote has mostly military history. And so I said just for this one to, to go in a new direction, partially just to challenge myself, um, which is probably not a good route for academics to take, but it's, it's what <laughs> keeps me uh, keeps me from getting bored. Um, more specifically, though, you know, I, I've had a, a lifelong interest in environmental questions, environmental justice, environmental activism, but it hadn't until this project really come into my scholarship. And the origins for it, uh, sort of the origin story for this particular book, is that I've been teaching for many years a, a class on the history of American slavery, uh, and one of the things I, I try very hard to do with my students is to get them to read as many primary sources as, as they can. And, and, and one year I decided that I was tired of reading the slave narratives that we had, everyone had read millions of times before. I didn't want to read <laughs> Frederick Douglass again. I didn't want to read, you know, Harriet Jacobs for the 25th time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I assigned Charles Ball's slave narrative, which is, an extraordinarily interesting narrative. It doesn't get read very much, and partially because it's pretty long. Um, Frederick Douglass is, you know, nice to teach because it's very short. Charles Bowles mm-hmm. is not short. <laughs> but one of the things I found in reading it and reading it with my students was how astutely Charles Ball and, and Charles Ball was enslaved in a variety of places. He's, he's enslaved in Chesapeake. He spent some time in South Carolina and Georgia and other places. So he sees a number of different landscapes. One of the things that struck me was how astutely he observed the environment and how he made connections between his own bondage, his own enslavement, the the the, the horrors of his life produced by slavery and the landscapes he was in you know and so he describes tobacco plantations in maryland and virginia he describes rice plantations in south carolina he describes the the ways in which the landscape and you know and and not only the land but the the sea and the you know animals are all sort of part and parcel of this this horrific system and so that really is sort of the starting place for this project was was trying to sort of see like what did people like Charles Ball, who, you know, how did environment shape their enslavement? What what was that relationship there? So that's really where the project started. Oh, that's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. I was reminded of a, a moment, I think it was like 15 years ago now, when I was looking at graduate programs. I had a conversation with Ari Kelman, the great historian in American West, about, about it, the field of environmental history and he remarked on, you know, it's been obviously a couple of generations of, of excellent work, but how it was unusual there is still no single volume environmental history of American slavery. It just didn't, it didn't exist. And this, is, and this is 15 years later. It also still didn't exist until the spring. And so, well, of course, lots of people have done, have done ex- exemplary environmental work on slavery as part of, of pieces of a project. We didn't have this synthetic environmental history. And, and I think it's because writing it is really tricky. Um, you know, there's partly just because of the the variety inherent in the subject, right? The variety of different forms that slavery took across time and certainly across space. And certainly, the, the, then as you comment in the book, you know, the, the big variety of Southern landscapes themselves. And to say, 
the South as an environment is a tricky thing to say to begin with. Um, so I wonder if you could share with listeners how you grappled with the many intellectual obstacles of writing a book like this and, and why you ended up structuring it like you did. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, one thing that struck me, and I guess uh, Ari and I are on the same page about this, when I started to research this project, I was surprised somebody hadn't written this book already. <laughs> um, right. And then I did some more work and then I realized why people hadn't written this book already. Um, <laughs> so, you know, in some ways it is a big story to tell. We're talking about the experience uh, of millions of people over a couple hundred years, over a huge and very diverse geographic space so how do you go about doing that you know and lots of people have done parts of this story and so one of the things that i was trying to do in this book is to stitch together different kinds of 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 historiographies that weren't necessarily in conversation with each other there is for instance a huge historiography on southern agriculture in slavery what's the relationship between slavery as a system and the agricultural systems that develop uh in the South uh, during the colonial period and throughout the 19th century and then afterwards. Uh, but those were often very sort of limited in, in very particular ways. For instance, there, there were you know, lots of discussions in those books about erosion and soil degradation, which are very important themes. Um, but they had no interest in what happened to that soil once they got leached away. What happened, mm. what were the consequences of soil erosion, not only for the land that the soils are eroding from, but where does the soil go to? And Mm -hmm. what effects does that have? Um, And so I wanted to sort of see if I could sort of zoom out from that kind of literature. Um, You know, and then there have been a number of of small studies. I don't mean small in terms of intellectual size, I just mean in terms of their scope and size. You know, people who are looking at individual regions or, or parts of the South or particular plantations that were very, very helpful. Uh, but some, you know, what I want to do in some ways in this book was to provide a, a sort of a synthetic overview and try to give some kind of, uh, you know, intellectual through line for the whole thing. In terms of the challenges, obviously one of the big challenges for me, um, you know, I knew the scholarship on slavery. I, I did not know the scholarship on environmental history particularly well beyond what I had read in graduate school. So I spent a long time, you know, reading environmental history, both, you know, theory and practice. I spent a lot of time reading agricultural history. Um, but at its core, the thing I spent my, most of my time working with was trying to figure out what are the sources that allow me to, to talk about an environmental history of slavery. And I wanted to privilege the voices of the enslaved to the extent that I could, right? So mm-hmm. I was reading fugitive slave narratives and saying, well, how, is, how are these also environmental narratives? I was reading the WPA interviews, these interviews that are done in the 1930s with formerly enslaved people, and trying to read and see, okay, what is it that they are saying, not only about their experience in bondage, but about the physical and, and natural environments around them. Um, and I also spent a lot of time reading sort of scientists and naturalists from the 19th century, because uh, I found that they, you know, people like um, Frederick Law Olmsted or Audubon or these kinds of people who are going to the South, who are looking not primarily at slavery, but looking for other things, looking, trying to, you know, they're looking at rocks or trees or birds or something, but they are noticing with a, with the outsider's eye. And I think that's really kind of critical. The, relationship between slavery and the environment and, and making connections there. Um, and, and so I think that was really sort of the driving force behind it. Obviously, this kind of project, I couldn't structure it around an individual person because nobody lives for 200 years, um, <laughs> you know, and, and so I tried, ended up doing it thematically, doing the chapters around different natural phenomena. So there's a chapter on soil and a chapter on animals and a chapter on trees and swamps and rivers and what have you. Um, but I also tried very hard in the to give it not just sort of make these chapters not only sort of focused on these themes, but make them connected to each other and to show how the growth of slavery in the United States during the and its predecessors during the colonial period, uh, you know, how the growth of slavery as a as an institution transformed the environment. So there is a a chronology to it, even though it's a, a 
very strange chronology to it, suggesting the ways in which slavery as an institution and as an economic system transformed the Southern environment over a period of, of, of centuries. Yeah, let's let's get into it then. Now, and let's start with that first chapter, where which is about the land, you know, sensibly enough. And and you have this challenge here of how do you distinguish the effects of the institution of slavery from the effects of agriculture and development in general, in, in some sense here. And, and of course, they're intertwined. But um, and in that chapter, I, I love that you braid together both soil exhaustion, erosion, and mining. And you and you give more sustained attention to mining than I think some would expect in this book. And it works really well, I think. But so how does, it, with the case of the land and soil, how, how do you see slavery as a mode of production ex- exacting a distinctive to- toll on the land? Well, so the, one of the things that, that in, enslavers in the South recognized was that their wealth and their power was not in real estate it was in people that that there was the 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 wealth they had in people and that there was always more land that they could acquire and it was cheaper for them they understood to try to extract as much labor from the people that they enslaved and destroy the soil and acquire new land Um, and that made southern agriculture in the american south different from agriculture in other parts of the united states Um, in very profound ways. I mean, to be sure, if you look at farmers in in New England and and the Midwest, they're doing all kinds of soil destructive properties. But it's very very different than both the rate uh, in which Southerners are doing it, but also the philosophy in which Southerners are approaching the soil. They they see that, look, if there is a forest, we can, we can, White Southerners are saying we can have enslaved people clear cut the forest, plant tobacco, grow tobacco profitably for a few years, and then move on. And so there's just this really insatiable hunger for um, land in, in, in the South. This also makes slavery in the American South different, maybe, than slavery in some other parts of the New World. So if you're thinking about slavery, in the West Indies, where land is at a premium, and mm-hmm. you know, where sugar cultivation and, and coffee cultivation and other crops, there is a finite amount of land there, and so they're dealing with land in a very different way. Um, but in in Virginia and in the Chesapeake and and and, and throughout the American South, there are planters are, are looking at at the map and saying, "Look, I could fertilize the soil, but that's expensive and time consuming, or I could just acquire new land in." Alabama or Mississippi or Texas. And so there's this expanding slave frontier throughout the colonial period, throughout the 19th century until the Civil War, um, that is driven by this kind of understanding about the relationship between labor, enslaved labor, and land. And there are huge consequences for this beyond its effects upon the soil. There are consequences for Native peoples, right? If you're thinking about Indian removal, and if you're thinking about the Indian removal being sort of the the, the polite way of saying, but genocide is <laughs> the, the more accurate way, maybe of saying it through not only the forced, you know, westward uh, push of, of Native peoples, but also the the extermination through warfare. Part of that thrust is driven by this need for land. If we're thinking about the domestic slave trade, why is this domestic slave trade so traumatic? Why do we have a million enslaved people taken from the upper South into the deep South over the course of you know the first half of the 19th century? It's because the, the epicenter of slavery shifted from the Chesapeake to the deep South. And that's because the Chesapeake, Virginia and Maryland, the soil had been degraded to the point where it wasn't profitable anymore. And so enslavers said, let's go to Alabama, let's go to Louisiana, let's go to Mississippi. And so there are real consequences, horrible consequences for this kind of soil degradation of, above and beyond the effect that it has on the land itself. You next then in chapter two, look at animals, both domestic and wild. And and I hear, I think it's even more obvious that the kinds of human interactions we see with the non-human world are, are really distinctive and unique to enslaved agriculture. That if the way they're treating animals is not about subtropical farming, it's about it's about slavery. 
and and uh, both in how animals are exploited and also how they're marshaled in resistance to slavery. And could you share maybe an example or two of, of that oh, kind of helps could, us see this? I could sh- sh- show you a, oh, a dozen. But one thing. We'll that, save them that, for the book. People have to buy the book. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that that that's you see if you read fugitive slave narratives or WPA narratives is that enslaved people and formerly enslaved people often compared their plight in slavery to that of animals. They, you know, one man described it being an enslaved, being enslaved as, as being an animal without hope, right? That they described being treated like mules, like cattle, you know, that they are being bought and sold. They are being abused like animals. And so there's, there's real identification with, with non-human animals by, by, by the enslaved. Uh, lots of the work, obviously, that enslaved people are doing is with animals, um, and and the animal that really gets identified most with enslaved labor is the mule, right? That, that enslavers embrace the mule as being the the preferred animal for enslaved people to use, in part because they see and enslavers claim they say, look, slaves are cruel to animals; they will maim them and so we need to give them animals that they can brutalize and will still work and there's this very interesting relationship that develops between enslaved people and mules as a consequence but it, it is a you know uh, animal that is bred and there's a huge breeding uh, mule breeding um farms in, in kentucky among other places and george for, washington right uh, well george washington starts it right he's one of the first people to invest in mules he gets a gift of 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 donkeys from from Spain, and they start breeding. Anyway, um, you know they're producing thousands, hundreds of thousands of mules for enslaved workers. Um, and mules, of course, are, are sterile, so it is something you know, we have to be constantly reproduced. Uh, but animals, uh, you know, have a, have a profound impact on enslaved lives in other ways. Some enslaved people have dogs. Charles Ball, for instance, has has a dog. A uh, named Truman, who seems to be the closest friend he has throughout his time in bondage. He writes very lovingly about the time he spends with Truman because Truman not only is a companion, he goes actually from plantation to plantation. When he gets sold, he gets to bring his dog with him. Um, but he's also a very useful asset for Charles Ball when Charles Ball goes hunting, right? That if you have a dog, it allows you to do engage in, in and he's not hunting for recreation. He's hunting because that's one of the main sources of food for enslaved people is, is hunting and trapping. And having a dog makes that, you know, a million times easier. But you also have enslaved people who have a very different relationship with dogs, that, that enslavers use dogs as animals of terror to terrorize enslaved people, to catch runaway slaves. We have many accounts of, of specially bred bloodhounds or other kinds of tracking dogs that are there to catch enslaved people and sometimes not only to to find them but to attack them once we have a, a dog accounts of people being basically eaten alive by 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 slave catching dogs there's other animals like horses that have a really profound kind of um role in terms of the, their their you know, a man on horseback is able to observe a, a, a an overseer on horseback is able to observe a huge number of enslaved people. It's one of the instruments of violence on the plantation. You know that an overseer with a whip on a horseback can run down a slave who's trying to escape. He can oversee, you know, a cotton field. Uh, so it's a, a vehicle of of in a, in a boat. In, in, multiple senses of, of observation and brutality. Um, yeah. And then in, in chapter three, you examine forests and uh, chiefly deforestation across the region. And, and here you argue that for enslavers, um, there was sort of a, a positive feedback cycle. And you showed this actually again, when your chapter on swamps, uh, this cycle where felling trees, both advance their economic aims and, and also increase their power over enslaved peoples. So how did that work? Well, so, you know, prior to the the development of of plantation agriculture in the American South, there was a lot more forest land than there is now Mm -hmm. or or was then. Um, And enslavers saw cutting down 
forest as as a, a you know barrier to to the expansion of the slave frontier. So there was a, a real desire and drive to to basically deforest large parts of the, of the South to replace them with cotton plantations, sugar plantations, you know, tobacco plantations, what have you. Um, and that served multiple economic interests, right? They could use that not only do they cut down the forest, but then they use that to re to to create, build the plantation, mm-hmm. to build the slave cabins, to build the fences, to build the the, uh, you know, the the plantation house. They use that to power steamships, the steamships going up and down the Mississippi, which are primarily fueled by by wood, and are and are using an ignore an enormous amount of wood. There's a there are different kinds of steam engines in the use in the 19th century. But they, they try very the, – the ones that are, are preferred along the Mississippi are the ones that are the most um, hungry in terms of, of wood consumption. So they are stopping every few miles to pick up a huge, enormous amount of wood to burn. And steamships are very important. I think our image of steamships along the Mississippi can be kind of romanticized. <laughs> we have this image from Mark Twain and other things about what steamships were. But they were – among other things, vessels for shipping cotton down the Mississippi, uh, you know, then to New Orleans and to the rest of the world. But they're also vehicles for moving enslaved people then up the Mississippi, mm-hmm. you know, and thinking about the relationship there, but how wood that is cut down by enslaved people is used to fuel the ship that is then instrumental to the whole development of slavery as a system. There are huge um, iron production facilities in the South that are using charcoal, that is using wood that is cut down. There's many more examples that we can give. Mm-hmm. One of the consequences, though, of all of this just deforestation is the removal of spaces that enslaved people could go to. You know, that enslaved people, when they ran, they ran, enslaved people ran away for any number of reasons, a number of ways. But one of the ways in which enslaved peoples use the environment was they said, look, I, we can run to the forest, we can run to the swamps. These are places where we can use the environment to our advantage. These are places we can hide and live and maybe escape to freedom in. The experience of cutting down those forests, though, removes that um, natural haven that enslaved people had. And people who are working, helping enslaved people run away from slavery notice this. They say, look, 40, 50 years ago, there was forests here. It was a lot easier to smuggle enslaved people out of bondage than it is today when it is now open land and much harder for people to to cross through unnoticed. Hmm. So there are real advantages for enslavers to, to remove uh, forest land and for getting rid of swamps. Swamps were the great haven for for maroon communities in the american south one of the things historians are recognizing more and more is how there's good scholarship on maroon communities in the caribbean where where there's been over the past decade or so a lot more work done on maroon communities in the american south especially in the great dismal swamp which is this enormous swamp um, that uh, borders between virginia and north carolina that was the home to hundreds of 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 maroons um starting the colonial period going through the civil war and enslavers hate it because mm-hmm. they, they see they see the, the the presence of a maroon community is detrimental to slavery as an institution and they want to drain the swamp and they're going to build canals through it they try to use uh, enslaved labor to to go and try to to remake that landscape to make it more profitable for them and to make it more hostile for maroons and you know among the people who are involved in trying to drain that swamp was george washington so i guess Mm -hmm. drain the swamp in washington (laughs) um has a different meaning in in the 18th century but um (laughs) you know there there's efforts in other parts of the south to to take swamp land that have been claimed by maroon communities in south carolina and louisiana and other parts and remaking that space by draining the swamp, by clearing the, the trees, by removing that kind of refuge that the environment created for enslaved people. 
Yeah, and then in the next chapter, you examine waterways, which is just a mammoth mammoth topic to try to take on in a chapter, and you 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 pair it with a mammoth claim. You say that you conclude that the Mississippi River and its tributaries made slavery in the United American South possible. So, would you sketch out that claim for us in a couple minutes? <laughs> sure. So, you know, the during the 19th century, you know, the Mississippi became the the artery of slavery in the United States. You know, the, after the Louisiana Purchase, the, the control of the Mississippi, you know, made New Orleans the biggest city in the South, became the epicenter of cotton trade and also the sugar trade, that the land along the Mississippi became among the most valuable land anywhere in the United States. It became home to the largest and wealthiest plantations in the United States. Um and that would not have been possible were it not for the richness of the soil created by the Mississippi and the way the Mississippi had for millennium overflowed its banks and, and filled the soil adjacent to it with really rich, profitable soil. That's really works well for, for producing cotton, among other crops. You know, one of the aspects about the Mississippi, though, that 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 both made it profitable was this flooding, but it also made it dangerous. That one of the things enslavers along the Mississippi wanted to do from the very beginning was how do we control this river to make it do what we want it to do? And so they build a levee system and you start to see this under French and Spanish and, and, and American occupations of, of Louisiana, but then up all along the Mississippi where they build levees. And who is building the levees? Well, it's enslaved people who are building the levees. And so the process of levee building becomes, you know, another kind of the brutality of labor that enslaved people are doing. And they are doing it in addition to the brutal labor that they are engaging in on cotton plantations. And when levees break, and the levees break a lot, <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the difficulty with the, the levee system and the, and and the Mississippi is that the higher they make the levees, they actually make the river elevate, and the sort of the river bottom gets above the level of the land. So when it floods, it just, it just decimates the landscape. But repairing the levees when these breaches happen becomes, you know, that is a task that enslaved people are tasked with, and often die from, right? This is not easy labor of trying to battle back a, a breach in a levee. You know, when the levees break, it, it is often enslaved people who suffer the most. It is their homes on the plantation that end up getting flooded, right? And slave quarters are on low-lying la land oftentimes. Enslavers put their house up on a hill so they can be safe when the flooding happens. But, you know, enslaved people have... You know, um, a very different relationship with with the river and and and, and with the you know environmental conditions produced by it. Yeah, and so in that way, you, the book adopts this environmental justice lens there, and and it continues when you turn your attention to the weather itself in your chapter on weather. Um, when you look at and you look at uh, storms and and heat and cold. And you know why? Why was it that enslaved people? What are some other other reasons that enslaved people were were kind of um, especially vulnerable to these disparate social impacts of southern weather and climate? Sure. So you know, I think anyone who's been to the South knows that the South's weather can be both very intense and very unpredictable. Um, you know, the enslaved people obviously worked in the heat. You know, oftentimes without adequate access to water. So there's many, many examples I found of enslaved peoples suffering from basically heat stroke, dehydration, uh, the other ill effects, blindness uh, from working in extraordinarily hot weather. Um, at the same time, I found many examples of enslaved people suffering from extreme cold. There are parts of the South where it does get extremely cold, even parts of the deep South where you occasionally randomly have a snowstorm or or a freeze. You know, and these had real consequences for enslaved people that, you know, they were often inadequately clothed either for hot weather or for very cold weather. We have many examples of enslaved people getting 
frostbite of, of being forced to work under conditions that are either too hot for anyone to reasonably be outside or too cold for anyone to work without proper clothing on. Slave cabins exacerbated this. In the summertime, slave cabins, and you will notice this if you visit plantations or slave labor camps, as some people want to think of them as. If you visit these sites and you go into enslaved quarters, they are ovens in the summertime. They are very, very hot. Whereas if you go into the plantation house where the white people live, they have all kinds of, of techniques involved to cool those spaces when it's too hot. Uh, breezeways and fans and all kinds of things. In the wintertime, the opposite is the case. If you go into the, the, the enslaver's house, he's got fireplaces and good insulation and all kinds of things. They are comfortable. Slave cabins, they'll become bitterly cold and drafty. And so there are real ways in which enslaved people are at the mercy of, of the weather in a, in a very profound way. Uh, and they are also at the mercy of of storms, and and you know they don't have obviously any kind of <laughs> forecasting or anything we'd recognize as forecasting um, in in the 18th and 19th century, and even today, you know the 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 weather in the South can be very uh, mercurial. Um, maybe that's a bad pun. Um, you know, so you could have a, a sunny day one day and a torrential downpour five minutes later, and and these had real consequences for enslaved people that that hurricanes when they hit they have a very disproportionate effect on the enslaved population if you look at, at where the largest density of, of enslaved communities were in places like south carolina in the gulf coast they are often in sites that are vulnerable to damage by hurricanes so we think about the sea islands in georgia and south carolina they're basically just like little, you know, very low lying plots of sand on the water. And when those get hit by a hurricane, you know, these slave cabins often wash away. The enslaved people often disappear. And so we have many accounts of, of destruction of, of enslaved property, of enslaved lives as consequences of hurricanes that hit the Gulf Coast and, and, um, and the Atlantic Coast. Uh, throughout the colonial period and the 19th century. There's a, a particularly devastating hurricane that hits um, what is called Last Island that, that was sort of a resort island um, off the Gulf Coast. You know, and most of the people who die in there are enslaved, you know, and, and, and we see dozens and dozens of examples of, like that. So. Mm -hmm. Though the book it moves, as we've been saying, it moves um, thematically from landscape feature to landscape feature. When we get to the closing chapter on the Civil War, it all comes together. You really, you really you know, explicitly pull all the threads together and we start to see that we've been kind of getting the grammar we need to understand um, the war and what happened with enslaved, enslaved people during the war. And so I, can you tell us a little bit about how, how a fuller understanding of slavery's environmental history helps us appreciate the course that emancipation took in the United States? Sure. So, you know, if we look at the scholarship on emancipation, there's been a real change in the way that historians have talked about emancipation over the past 30 years. You know, we used to talk about emancipation as being an event, and it was Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. We've got the, these discrete things. The shift over the past 30 years has been to talk more about emancipation as first being a, a ground up process that, that enslaved people are emancipating themselves that that the in the process of running away from slavery um enslaved people are really pushing the and formerly enslaved people are really pushing emancipation for themselves uh, and and we need to understand that process and to think about you know, emancipation really as a process more than an event so it's something that doesn't happen at a particular moment in time it happens in a variety of different ways in different places and it's shaped by things like federal policy, like what Lincoln and Congress are doing. It's shaped by things the military is doing. And so our understanding of emancipation is a lot more complicated and nuanced than it was a generation ago. And what I wanted to do in this chapter was say, okay, what then do we get if we add the environment into that equation? 
And one of the things I recognized was that in first enslaved people were able to use their knowledge of the environment to do this kind of self-emancipation. They understood how to navigate through swamps and through forests uh, to get to union lines, to claim freedom for themselves and for their families. I also recognized that enslaved people then became great assets for the Union Army as spies, as scouts, as guides, and as soldiers to help navigate through a landscape that they knew intimately well. They understood how the landscape worked and could use that knowledge and share that knowledge with other people in the Union effort to destroy slavery. And so if we're trying to understand the ways in which slavery ended, bringing you know, that environmental knowledge that enslaved people and formerly enslaved people had into the story really gives a, 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 you know, a, a certain kind of coloration to, to our story of, of, of emancipation. You conclude the book with a fascinating and um, overlooked speech by Frederick Douglass, and he gave eight years after the war. Um, in which he claimed that, quote, emancipation has liberated the land as well as the people. And of course, reading that today, we we wish either of those things had been true. And we know that exploitation of land and people continues in the region and the country and around. And you, in in your acknowledgments, you, you know, kind of, you share a reflection that, you know, as you worked on the book, your mind was much on the climate crisis and on BLM and the latest phase of the black freedom struggle. And when you close your book, you, you urge us to think about both how the history of slavery you know, we, we should think about the history of slavery when we think about climate change and that we should remember the environmental destruction in the South when we think about the legacies of slavery. Um, why is it important to these contemporary struggles to keep these connections in mind? Well, you know, when I was writing this book, you know, it was in the midst of the and the ongoing, um, you know, global environmental crisis and this very intense conversation, debate, whatever call whatever you or you want to use, you know, discussion about about the legacy of slavery and the the, the the issues, the ongoing issues that Americans are facing regarding race and and, and the history of, of, of race in the United States. So it was impossible to escape this book, um, even when I was not officially researching it. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I recognized uh, is that you know the story that I'm telling is, is very much the story of, of slavery in the environment, but that the the scars on the land, to, to, to use the, the title of the book, is you know they don't entirely disappear when when slavery does. That there are profound legacies to for 150 years and today that demonstrate the ways in which race and the environment are linked. You know, so if you look at, at the questions about uh, environmental justice today. If you look at places like a Cancer Alley in um, Louisiana, you know an area in which there's been enormous chemical uh, pollution that have affected the local communities. Who are the local communities? They are the descendants of enslaved people. Is that an accident? I don't think it is. I, you know, and I think the the ways in which you know the land in the South has been brutalized in slavery um, has recognizable features today. You know, if you look at, at, at the relationship between black poverty in the South and other parts of the United States and environmental poverty, those things are, are, are tied together. Um, you know, and what I wanted to sort of hint at in those books is that, that these struggles that we are facing today you know, o- over racial justice and the struggles we are facing, fighting today over trying to save our planet, those are not disconnected struggles. And that, that we need to, and to the extent that the history of this is helpful, you know, recognize that those are, we need to deal with those simultaneously. Uh, and I'm hoping this book will provide, you know, something of a, at least a, a backdrop to help people understand that, that relationship. Yeah, I really think it will. Um, and, and I hope it, I hope you're kept very busy sharing this book with with audiences uh, in the months to come. But I can't help but wonder what might be happening for you after that uh, calms down a bit. And so I wonder, do you foresee doing future work in environmental history? Or as you say, do you are you on to the next field to conquer? Well, and, and... <laughs> um, I, I undoubtedly will be doing some more environmental history in the future. I think it's I think it's increasingly impossible to write about history without talking about the environment, at least 
on some level, even if it's not quote unquote environmental history. I think environmental history as a discipline has had, you know, is being incorporated more into mainstream narratives than it once was, right? That we, there was a period of time in which environmental history was sort of its own separate corner and, and, and people would sort of smile and nod and say, look, environmental history is they're doing good stuff about national parks and not <laughs> And I don't think we're in that world anymore. I don't think we can be in that world anymore where environmental history is a distinct and separate field I mean, obviously, it will always be a distinct and separate field, but but that that it will not bleed into everything else, right? That we are, we all have to be environmental historians on on, on one level, and we all have to sort of recognize, you know, the the, the ways in which environmental history is shaping the, the historical questions we're asking, the sources we're looking at. Um, so yes, I think every project from now on is going to be environmental history, which is not really the answer to your question. Um, what I'm working on uh, now. I'm working on two two projects that are very very different. Uh, neither are strictly environmental, but I guess I'll, I'll, for my earlier answer, everything's environmental. Uh, one is um, a group biography of about 20 people, whom no one has ever heard of, who fought against white supremacy um, during Reconstruction, and it's sort of an interwe- interweaving narrative of, of people who. Um, it's sort of like Game of Thrones where you have a whole huge cast of characters and they're all moving in different spaces and then they occasionally bump into each other at various unexpected ways. Um, but instead of White Walkers, you have Klansmen. Um, oh, yeah. And a bunch of them don't live to the end of the book. Um, <laughs> so that, that that's a project I'm working on right now that's a, a, my sort of serious academic scholarly project. The other project I'm working book I'm working on right now, which is a project I started during the pandemic when everything was shut down and and the world was too scary to do anything else. (laughs) I'm writing a book on how American history has been depicted in video games. Huh? Cause I like video games and, and, and everything was shut down. So I played some video and I was trying to think about how, you know, if Americans and people around the world learn history through television and movies, and we know that those mediums are very powerful for how people make sense of the past, even if it's in convoluted and distorted ways, video games do the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So trying to make sense of, of, you know, how does Oregon trail explain how (laughs) Americans see certain kinds of content? How does, you know, Red Dead Redemption or other kind of games like that. You know, how does that shape Americans' understanding of the past? So that's the that's the sort of fun side project that I'm working on. Oh, that's wonderful. I think a lot of people keep their eyes peeled for that one. Uh, but but this book, again, is Scars on the Land, an environmental history of slavery in the American South. Its author, my guest, is David Silkenet. It's available now from Oxford, so go snag one right away. And check out The Whiskey Rebellion wherever you listen to your podcasts. David, thank you so much for your time today and for this book. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed this.